and you'll see something come across the top of the screen that says that recording is in progress. All right, we're very excited. Presentation. Um, so have you escaped? Go back to here. Yep, and then oh, we'll have you hit. Uh, might be another one. Did you jump off? I don't know what I did. There we go. Okay, okay. Now hit join now. Sorry, that's okay. Bye. And then back to the share. Right here. I hit the wrong. Yep. That's okay. Where's the share go? Just hit stop and then reshare. Now we'll click on this one right here. There you go. Okay. All right. So we're very excited to have uh, Diane Gambrell from Smarter Spaces here tonight. Um, she'll be sharing a presentation titled Life Cycle of Hoarding, a view from a professional organizer. So Diane is a professional organizer and order, owner of Smarter Spaces LLC. Diane works with clients who need extra time and patience to go through their belongings with goals of decluttering, organizing, and living with less stuff. Many of her clients since 2011 have been dealing with ADD, ADHD, physical challenges, or hoarding. Diane will discuss the steps new clients experience as they work with her and as they declutter with her guidance. Hoarding is a complicated condition that has many causes and evolves in multiple ways as clients learn skills and get the support they need. So thank you very much, Diane. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Um, first, I want to clear up that I do not work for the Minnesota Hoarding Task Force. Um, I am a prior member of this group. Um, I have my own business, and you know, if someone's interested in working with me, it would be an arrangement between myself and you. Um, so I'm going to talk about the steps that I go through with people who are hoarding from my viewpoint. Um, as Michelle said, I've been working as an organizer since 2011. Uh, before that, I had two previous careers, computer programmer analyst and librarian. And what I discovered was I really liked working with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I'm currently working with four different people who are hoarding. The best training that I've gotten has come from the Institute for Challenging Disorganization. So this presentation is an introduction only meant to give you a taste of what it's like to work with an organizer in a home with a lot of clutter. There are multiple ways that I can help such a client. I might do some sorting of items first so that they can see all the shoes they have or all the office supplies before they decide how many to keep. But the most common approach with clients is to actually work side by side with them as they make decisions about each thing from a closet, a desk, a tabletop or other defined areas. For those calling in by phone, I will try to read all the info on the slides as we go, and please hold your questions to the end. So when I say view from a professional organizer, um, I'm talking about my experience with my clients. I'm not a researcher, I'm an organizer. And so I have experience with the people that I have worked with. Um, I use my training to help clients, and I will take you through the steps that I do with my clients. The same steps actually are used whether a client is hoarding or not. People who have a lot of clutter need direction, someone to help them stay focused on the task and not allow them to quit after 10 minutes of work. They also need to make a decision on each item as to whether they will keep it or not. It is not okay for me to decide where things will go, and then when I leave for the day, the client can't find it. It is much better if the client has to decide where it will be used and where it belongs. All of my clients, whether hoarding or not, need time to decide what they're keeping. Those that are hoarding definitely need more time because they are not used to making decisions. They have put off decisions probably for years. That requires more patience for me. Instead of demanding a quick answer if they are stuck, I might ask some questions to help them decide, or we can set some things aside for later. 
Folks who are hoarding also need someone who will not judge the state of their home. I am more interested in what is getting done and improvements from week to week. During our time together, clients will learn uh, some processes, procedures, and techniques from me only because we repeat them and repeat them. Clients start to focus on their future, focus on their future uh, throughout this process, and that is a wonderful thing for me to see. So here is this infamous scale, the ICD clutter hoarding scale. And what I want to point out on here is that I almost never work with people who are in level one or level two, because this is the clutter end of the clutter hoarding scale. These people probably just have a small amount of clutter that they could pick up in an hour, or if they don't have organizational skills, they may need me to come in for one three hour session and help them, and then we're done. However, level three and four are the levels that I work in the most. This is where people are having trouble controlling the amount of stuff that they bring in and probably letting very little out the door. Uh, stuff is not put away. It's piled on their table or their bed. Um, and if they're in level four, there are probably pathways through their house, making it an easy way to trip on stuff. I don't normally work in a level five home, which is the hoarding end of the scale. And this is truly hoarding disorder as defined by uh, the, the DSM, which is uh, a medical book. Um, and the reason for that is um, I would probably have to wear special clothing. I would have to probably have something on to breathe clean air. And it's probably not a place that anybody should be living. So once in a while, I'll have one room in a home that's at a level five, and maybe the rest of the rooms are at a level three or a level four. So hoarding looks different in every home. This is a picture of a bedroom that's being used as an office by someone who is no longer going into work, but working from home. And at the same time, she's using the room for a pantry. And the pantry aspect of this room has pretty much taken over everything, including the top of the desk, which you can't see in this photo. Um, this is also an example of a hoarded room. This room had basically been ignored for five to 10 years. and in complete disarray, very dusty. Uh, the owner only used this room to add more things to it and then ignored it. This is another example of someone who is hoarding. These are a number of picture frames that she was willing to part with on a particular day. And if I'm donating things, I always take a snapshot so that I can make a nice list for them of what they've donated. She had generations of photos, and her intent was to put those nice photos into these nice frames and then share them with family members. But the photos sat in boxes in the closet, the frames sat in other boxes in the closet, and the project never got done. And so in a one-bedroom apartment, this was just taking up too much space. This is another example. This is about 12 or 14 bags of clothing. Uh, probably the most I've ever removed from a uh, home in one day. I did work side by side with the owner. Um, in her case, it was almost a blessing that the apartment above her had a water leak and got everything in her bedroom wet. And so a company came in, took all the clothing to be washed, dried, folded, and put in large um, moving boxes. And so it was very easy for the client to look at what she had in those boxes and decide how many pair of pants to keep, how many, how many shirts to keep, and so on. Um, and so she felt pretty good about being able to do that step with me. Here's another category of things that I do find in, in hoarded homes, and that's childhood treasures. Um, this is a large dollhouse that's now in my car that's going to donate. And on the right is a large stuffed walrus, also in my car, going to donate. Um, people who are hoarding often have a positive connection to their childhood. And so 
treasures like this or children's books or coloring books or dolls mean a lot to them and uh, they find it hard to part with those things. So this does require a gentle hand to work with someone who is keeping this kind of item. So when I get to know the client, um, I, I want to find out if they are hoarding or not. And often they have not been diagnosed. Um, they may have a fear that they're hoarding, but they don't know. And so I will just sort of collect information that I see as we're working. If they have multiple collections, or if they have more stuff still coming into the house when we're trying to remove stuff from the house, or they might be keeping a lot of mother's or grandfather's stuff, including furniture, which takes up a lot of space, or they may have a lot of to-do projects that never get done or no progress is ever made from them. They're just sitting in a corner in some room. Or they have clutter in doorways or hallways or on the floor, making it difficult to navigate the house and also really affecting safety if they have a medical problem and we need to get the EMS in there or the fire department. They also can develop something called clutter blindness. Um, this means that those piles, whether they're on the table or on the floor or on the couch or on the bed, uh, have been there so long that they basically don't see them when they walk by it. And so um, they, they're not so worried about that pile because it's been there for a long time. I might see years of dust. I, I might see a home that has stuff scattered all over to the point where it would be difficult to clean any room. Um, some people would rather not be at home and deal with it. And so they go on lots of vacations or they're involved in lots of activities in the community. Other people are just the opposite. They almost never leave home. They certainly aren't gonna let anybody in their home. Um, and then the thing that really defines if it's hoarding disorder is they have great difficulty letting, going, letting go of stuff. Um, they might let one or two things out the door, but then everything else it must stay there. That's their opinion. <clears throat> Another thing that I, I, I see as being common among people who hoard is they cancel a lot of, of appointments with me. And the reasons that they use are, my health is bad today, or I'm just feeling too much anxiety, or I'm too busy with other things. And so, taking care of the clutter in their home becomes a lower priority. I do not require the client to tell me about their health history or possible reasons why they are hoarding. I start out as a stranger in their home and I wanna earn their trust and let them know that I will always listen to what they have to say. Uh, and only when they are ready to talk do they have to uh, decide if they want to tell me about it. I'm not there as their therapist. I am instead there to help them sift through their stuff and help them get back in control of their life. So step one in this life cycle of hoarding is they already have a history before I meet them. Bad things have happened to them. And it can be any combination of things on the screen here, and I'm sure there are other things too, but these are the ones I run across. They either grew up in a cluttered or a hoarded home. And so there's some aspect of, is it genetic or was that their normal as a child? And they may or may not feel comfortable in that kind of a home, but it's in their background. Or they were never held to account or taught to control their stuff. Did mother ever say to you, please clean your room? Did mother ever show you how to clean your room? Did you ever have to donate your old toys? Um, someone who's kept everything since childhood just really has no way to figure out how to make a decision about that stuff. Um, I've worked with someone who was homeless and when they had nothing and now they feel like they need to have as much as they can hang on to because they never want to run out. A car accident can be very um, detrimental to someone's well-being and to their future. Perhaps after the car accident, their spouse left them, or they ended up with a very, um, a very uh, bad spine injury 
or they have a brain injury. And so now they're depending on other people for doing a lot of things that they used to be able to do. They're not independent anymore. They may have lost a parent, a child, a spouse, a job. I worked with a woman who had been married twice and both husbands took all of her money. And here she is with nothing now, but she's hoarding again. She's trying to collect things. I worked with people who were either abused in childhood or by a spouse, a previous spouse. Um, I've worked with people who were shamed by people who should have been their loved ones. Um, people tend to have a very low opinion of, of themselves at this point, and I don't know if there's a connection. This is something that really research should be done on, but a number of people have health issues that either can't be diagnosed or they've been misdiagnosed and they find out years later, no, you don't have that. You have something else. So we'll start all over. Step two also happens before I meet this person. They've been acquiring stuff and using it for protection or coping. So they might acquire stuff in multiple ways. Perhaps they used to go to garage sales with a parent. And now that the parent is gone, they still go to garage sales and buy things. Um, because that's a happy memory. Um, many other ways that they might collect stuff. They might prefer to give things to family, which does not happen. So it's common for people when I work with them that they'll want to set aside a box for cousin Joe and my sister Mary and a neighbor, and then we'll fill up those boxes, but it's really difficult to get them to actually give that stuff away, even to a family member. They may like the memories associated with the stuff. Um, what that means is something from a childhood or uh, grandma's sewing machine may mean so much to them that they want to keep that sewing machine, even if they never sew and it takes up room that they have, they don't have, they still want to keep it. Many know that there's a connection between their past and the stuff that fills their home. I do hear a few stories when people first call me about I think I do this because, um, but other people just really don't know. I don't ask them about it. It's not something I need to know. Um, people do get overwhelmed when they want to do something with the stuff. Um, I've had people tell me, you know, I wanted to work on the stuff on my table and I looked at it and I couldn't figure out how to start. So I just walked away. I'm done. I can't do it without you, Diane. That's, that's a common thing that I do here. And it's not me. It's just having another person there who is not judging them. They may have forgotten how to make decisions. Um, they uh, have gone so long without having to decide, I'm going to throw out this travel information, or I'm going to donate these pants that don't uh, fit anymore. And because of that, your brain really forgets how to do that task. It's like, I haven't worked on a crossword puzzle for 20 years, so I'm not going to be good at it. I'd have to practice to get good at it again. And then a number of people in this category also have poor organizational skills. Um, that could be due to an additional uh, condition that's going on with them, such as ADHD, because that has to do with executive function skills in the brain. Um, but it also could be that they've just never practiced. So this step, acquiring stuff, happens before I meet them. So now this person is reaching out, and why? Why are they reaching out? Well, one of four things has probably happened. The first is that police, fire, an inspector, either from the city or the county, or a landlord has intervened and said, I can see you weren't doing this on your own. You need to get help. And they might call the county, they might call uh, a senior helpline, or they might have a list of organizers to work with to help this person find somebody to work with. It could be that the person is fed up with their world at home and they want to change it. This doesn't happen very often. Um, a lot of people don't seem to be brave enough to get to this point on their own, and they need that push from the police, fire inspector, or landlord to actually call someone. It, can, it has also happened that somebody's been working with a therapist and it came out in therapy that they have a lot of clutter. And the therapist said, you've got to reach out and find some help. Um, I've had a, a few people do that. 
<clears throat> and then lastly, sometimes uh, people just need a little push and if family has tried to help them work in the home and that didn't work out, family might have said, we will offer for you to work with somebody and we will help pay for it. So when we're talking about the authority figures, the police, fire, inspector, or landlord, um, I have two requests. One is to give the homeowner a piece of paper, a paper list of goals that you want them to reach. This is important because when I come in to help this person, it's hard for me to get a definitive answer as to what the local authority figure is expecting to happen. And so if they have a paper list that they can show me that says, I want you to clear your hallway, no shelving in there, or I want you to clean behind all exit doors or whatever it is, I want you to clear around the furnace. Um, that helps me because now they have another authority, not me telling them, this is what we need to work towards. And then the second thing I ask is that that authority figure visit periodically. This can just be a 10 minute visit. Tell them you're going to come back in a month or three months, whatever is appropriate. Take a couple of photos, ask about their progress and suggest next steps. That I have seen people look forward to that I am working with. Um, they appreciate being checked up on uh, because if, if they're serious about making a change, that authority figure is giving them just a little nudge, which might be what they need. Um, and also, uh, it, it helps them with a little bit of social interaction with somebody in the community. Doesn't have to be a long visit. So step four, now I'm on the phone with this new person that I'm going to be working with. And I ask them, what kind of help are you ask, are you looking for? They may not say I'm hoarding. They may say, I just can't keep up with my house. I, I have a lot of stuff around that I'd like to put away. Or they might say, I'm going to lose my home. I had one lady tell me she had some glassware she wanted to sell. I had someone else tell me, I have a lot of VCR tapes that I want to recycle. That's why I want you to come. Um, or I have a number of, of things for my grandmother that I finally decided I'm ready to sell. I may need to make better use of my closet. So one person I went and worked with, I could not walk anywhere in that house without stepping on stuff on the floor. Uh, but yet she insisted that all we needed to do was to make better use of her closets. And what that tells me is she has a poor concept of what will fit in a room and what will fit in a closet, what will fit in a kitchen cabinet. And so in that case, I just say, okay, let's work on that. And along the way, I'm hoping that their, their um, concept of what will fit will improve. Um, they might say to me on the phone, I can't seem to start. And when I do, I just quit right away because I'm, I'm so frustrated. Or oh, I don't know where I should start. Um, I, I just can't figure it out. Uh, they might say, I can't tell what is trash and what is not trash. Um, this person that I worked with um, was hoarding, is hoarding, truly. Um, and she was trying to make decisions and just couldn't because she couldn't figure out if this thing she was holding was important or if it really did not uh, fit into her future. Um, a few people will say my family's after me to clean up the house. And unfortunately, these are the ones that don't last very long working with me. Um, and I think it's because, well, it, for a couple of reasons. One is they might just not be ready. Um, the person who I'm going to work with really needs to be ready to try. Um, and the second reason this might not work is because, uh, I'll give you an example. I worked with a lady twice. <clears throat> she was having a really hard time giving anything up, but we did clear some space in her kitchen. And the second meeting, we were going to work on things that were sitting on the stairway. And 
she said, this is causing me so much distress to look at this stuff and know that I can't keep it. She said, I think now I have a better idea what I need to talk to my therapist about. And then we took a break. And I think that was the best thing for her. She had connected the dots in her head and was ready to go another avenue and, and try and make progress, which I applaud her for. Um, and then I do work with people in three hour sessions and usually during that first phone call, they will ask me, so do you think we'll be done in about 10 sessions? I, I just work with them once a week. Uh, so this sounds like a lot if you work with someone once a week for 10 weeks. But uh, truthfully, I, I will say it's probably going to take longer. I can't predict how long it will be, but it will be longer than that. So at the end of this phone call, <clears throat> the client and I will agree to try it for one session. This is not a big commitment that they're making with me. Um, I want to meet them. I want to hear um, their evaluation of their home. I do ask for a tour of the home the first time. It doesn't have to be uh, more than 20, 30 minutes. Uh, but I want them to tell me about their house and how they're living in it. Uh, we will work side by side. I don't work in a different room when I'm working with them. I'm, I'm there next to them. Um, I tell them that I want to help. This is my job. Uh, this is what I love to do. I love to help people. And sometimes people feel bad that I'm there with them in the midst of their clutter. And I say, no, no, this is exactly where I should be. And then I tell them they can stop at any time. If they're uncomfortable after the first session, we will stop until they're ready. If they want to see me once a month, that's fine. We'll do that. So step six now, we're starting to work together. <clears throat> and my job is to get to know the client and to start building trust with them. It is now the client's job to get to know me, but also to keep an eye on me. Um, I, I understand that fully. I'm handling their stuff in a lot of cases, and um, I, I want them to know that I'm trying to be open with them and uh, show them what I'm doing with their stuff. I do to try and lighten the mood um, because I realize a lot of people uh, have anxiety before they meet me, and the day that we do meet, it's probably higher anxiety. Um, and so I, I do try and um, be calm, help them focus. Uh, we start out slowly on that first session, um, and I, I want them to feel that any progress that they've made was worth it that first time. I also give them enough time to make decisions without pressure. And what that means is uh, if they need silence while they're holding something and thinking about it, that's what we do. Uh, one technique that I use is I ask them to verbally think out loud. And that's not just for my benefit. It's also because if they say it out loud to themselves, sometimes it helps them really think through their logic and to think through their priorities. And for one woman that I've been working with, when we go through her stuff and she stops to talk about a photo or a letter or something from her grandmother, after she tells me about it, she says, OK, I can let it go. And that's wonderful. And then I do keep them focused on the task. Um, sometimes if somebody says, oh, I know where this belongs, I'll go put it in the kitchen and they don't come back. I'm going to call Julie, <laughs> come on back. <laughs> um, and often they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot you were here. <laughs> um, so it does happen. And, and then they say, oh, I'm glad you did that because I didn't realize what I was doing. But it happens. So step seven now, as I'm getting to know them and we're starting to work together, now I want to start asking them, how do you like doing this kind of work? Do you think this is important for you to do? Do you see any benefit in doing it? And these are the kinds of answers that I'm probably going to get back. First is, I don't want to lose my home. For anybody working with an inspector or the fire department, that's their answer. Um, but it might also be some of the other things listed here. They want guests to visit. They're tired of being alone or hiding. 
that is really at the top of the list for a lot of people. Um, they are embarrassed to let anybody in and they want that to change. They want to welcome somebody into their home. Or they may have an appliance like a refrigerator that needs to be replaced and they're too embarrassed to have the company come in and deliver a new refrigerator and take the old one away. Or they might have a plumbing leak or they might realize they're feeling less anxious now. Now that we're clearing some space, it feels better to be in that room. Um, they might have figured out that you know, I'm not tripping and falling as much as I used to because now my path is wider from my door through my living room. Um, some people, when they get farther along, they say, you know, I could start working on my hobby now because my table is half cleared off. Or now I have room on the floor to do some yoga. Uh, some people have not been sleeping in their bed. They've been sleeping in a recliner or on the couch. And they may know that that bed would be better for their back and they would like to sleep in their bed again. And then a big one for some people is they want to be able to control all their papers and their mail and their bills. Maybe they're behind on taxes. Maybe they know that they're always late paying their bills and they want that fixed. So these are the reasons I'm going to keep in my mind as I work with this person, because when they're having a bad day, I'm going to remind them. Remember, you want to sleep in your bed. That's why we're doing this. Okay, so now we're into step eight. This is going along with still decluttering and still talking about the reasons we're doing the decluttering. Uh, I'm going to start uh, giving them some education that they might not know about. Um, and one of the things is how they feel about their objects. So. I might ask them a question like, where did this pin cushion come from? And then they'll say, oh, that belonged to my grandma and I loved her and she was, I was her favorite. Um, and so we find out if there are warm memories or if they're bad memories. And it gives them some um, indication of why they might be keeping this. Um, another question I might ask them is, do you use this? Do you like it? If that could be in regard to clothes or shoes. Um, and what I want to do is help them figure out, does this item fit in your life now? Not necessarily your past memories, but is it useful in your life now? Um, <clears throat> clients know this question, this next question is coming, and that's where does this belong? <laughs> um, if we've gone through a stack of magazines and they've picked out five that they want to keep and read and the rest are going in recycling, then I, my next question is, where do these magazines belong? And for a lot of people, that is a new concept. It's like, well, I don't know, where does it belong? And so I'll ask them, where would you read the magazines? On your couch? In your bed? In the bathroom? Well, I'd probably read them at the end of the day when I'm in bed. Okay, then they belong in your bedroom. <laughs> um, pretty simple concept. But some people don't really think in those terms of everything should have a home. Um, and that's really what we're going for is everything that you own should have a permanent place so that you know where it is and it's easy to find when you want it. Um, you know, we, recycling has been around for many, many years, but it's, it's still interesting that a number of people don't know where to recycle electrical cords or old TVs or other special things. And so I, I will show them that their county has a website where they can look things up or I will look it up while I'm there with them. Um, maybe they haven't donated anything for 20 years and so they have, they have no idea if they prefer Salvation Army or Goodwill or something else. And so we can talk about those. We can look up those websites, see what they do, how they use their money, um, and they can decide. And I'd really prefer that the client decide and figure that out. That's really good for them to do that. Um, the last one on the slide here is I will ask them, what do you say to yourself when shopping? And of course, I'm trying to discourage them from shopping. I don't say never shop, uh, but I might say, if you go deliver something to Goodwill, please don't go in their store. That's just asking for trouble. Um, but when we have 
conversation after conversation about shopping, eventually they will understand that what I want them to do is ask themselves some questions when they go shopping. Do I need this? Where would I keep this? And can I afford it? So if they don't need it, it'd be better if you just walk away and, and say, yeah, that was a cute item, but I don't need it. Um, where would I keep it? And for some people, that means I need to give up something so I have room for this new item. Um, and then can I afford it? People who are hoarding uh, at a high rate tend to forget that everything that they bring in probably has some cost that they're paying and they're basically investing in everything they're bringing in rather than having it in their bank account. Um, and, and so I, I, I try to express my concern for their future. Okay, so near the end of the first or second room that we're doing, we start to talk about how I can support them. One thing is that people do have negative self-talk. They say it in front of me, and so I know they're doing it alone 10 times a day, saying it to themselves. But it, it always comes out as, I was so stupid to buy this, or what an idiot I am to get myself in this position. And I, I might let that go once, but the second or third time, I'm going to stop and say, whoa, whoa, uh, you are more than your hoarding behavior. You are a full person, and I'm getting to know you, and I think you're lovely, and you're so smart, and you're kind, and um, you can just see the smile on their face when I help them realize that there's so much more to them than the clutter in their house. Um, they will slip up and say negative things in front of me later, and I'll call them on it. But now they understand that it's it's not helpful. It's hurtful. Uh, some of them tell me, yeah, my therapist says the same thing. Um, so when I let them talk about the things that they find, um, sometimes that helps them let go. I talked a little bit about that before. But sometimes they come to realizations about the real connection that they have to their stuff, and they know it's not a healthy connection. And that's when I've had a number of people grieve their loss in front of me, express regret for how they've behaved, how they've collected things, and they also cry. And all I can do is sit there and be a good listener and this is probably the best opening to have where I ask them, do you have a therapist? Some do and some don't. I will work with someone who doesn't have a therapist. But when they get to this point, I will encourage them, are you ready to find a therapist? I recommend you find a therapist. And I will help them find a list of people that they can consider if they're at that point. Um, this is really a raw point for this person, and it's so, so important that I respect them and let them know that um, I want to support them as much as I can, but I am not a therapist. And so we need to add somebody to their team if, if that's not there already. Um, I will also ask them how much they need to keep of stuff. And as much as I would like them to give up 50% the first time we go through the house, I know it's not gonna happen. Um, if they have a bookshelf, they might let go of 10% of the books the first time. And I will congratulate that them on that. Um, I will tell them they did a good job. And the next time I see them, they're probably gonna say, you know, that felt pretty good. Um, I don't miss the books I gave up. Let's do it again. And I almost always say, Let, let's come back. Let's move on and do the next easy thing. Because I want to do the easy things first. Um, that helps them have some success and gives them some confidence. And it also helps their brain because their brain is getting more practice. And that's what we want. 
uh, it's at this point because we've gotten close to having one or two rooms done that I will start offering ideas for storage. I don't sell things and I understand that they're paying me uh, to come. So that's an expense. So I try to offer um, ideas for cheaper end storage. Uh, we'll find some used plastic uh, storage containers or something with drawers. Um, if they want to spend more, that's totally up to them. Um, but my focus is on helping them store things better in more useful furniture than what they might have. Uh, it's true in organizing that you are able to store more if you go vertically. If you have short bookshelves, that's okay. But if you have a lot of books, it's better to go vertical and have tall bookshelves. And uh, it's at this point that I will encourage them to think about their present and their future. We end up talking a lot about their past. Um, and so sometimes I, I just have to say, you know, I, I really want you to think about what you want today and this week and this year, and not so much about your past, um, because I think thinking about your present um, is going to help you move forward. This is not to negate anything that a therapist would have uh, be working with this person with. Um, and interestingly enough, when they start thinking about their future, a lot of people bring up the possibility of moving. And they don't necessarily buy into it early on, but now it's in the back of their head. My future, my future, what do I want my future to look like? It might be a smaller house. I don't have so much maintenance. It might be this house has too many bad memories. This is where my father died. I don't want to think about that anymore. I've lived here too long and I've let that suck the life out of me. Um, so again, I don't encourage this, but if if they want to consider it, um, we will talk about it down the line. So I know that a person may go to therapy for one reason, um, which may not have anything to do with clutter or hoarding. And so how does a therapist know um, if a client needs help with their house? And it's actually, hap I put the slide in here because it's actually happened that a client was seeing a therapist for years and the subject of hoarding never came up. And the therapist said, if you had told me years ago that you were hoarding, I would have done this completely differently. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think it's worth, if you see, uh, some signs as a therapist, um, go ahead and ask a couple more questions if you can, and, and maybe um, scope out um, if, if they need to be tested perhaps for ADHD or for hoarding. Um, do they have trouble keeping up with new mail? Do they know where important papers are? Do they pay bills on time? So if they just happen to mention, you know, I've been frustrated all day because I can't find my visa bill and it was due last week and I'm really worried about it. So do you have trouble paying more than your visa bill? Oh yeah, all the time, all the time. Do they lose things in the house? Do they get frustrated with that? Do they ever invite anyone in or are they too embarrassed? Do they trip on stuff in the home? Do they occasionally donate things? No, haven't donated anything for 20, 30 years. Do you sleep in your bed or somewhere else? So they might say, you know, I slept on my recliner last night and I've got the worst back aches. I really can't think today. So is that where you usually sleep or do you sleep in your bed? No, my bed's full of stuff. I can't sleep there. Um, and do they need a handyman, but they keep putting it off? So maybe they've got a broken air conditioner or the railing on their stairway is broken and they just keep putting it off. Those are all sort of, side effects of someone who has a lot of clutter or who might be hoarding. So now step 10, <clears throat> this is dealing with the memory stuff. And when we're going through rooms, we often find things from their past, sentimental items. And I'll ask them, should we start a box for your, for your keepsakes? Huh, I never thought of that. Yeah, let's do that. So I'll keep adding and we might have three boxes, eight boxes. And now we have a whole lot of keepsakes or mementos or memorabilia. 
Well, now if we go through those all as a group, um, they're going to see how much they have. And they're often surprised by the amount of stuff that has nothing to do with how they work in their, their home presently. This is stuff from their past. Um, and, and so that can help them get a good visual, but also hopefully not keep it all. Um, and then there's a special category of keepsakes called hurtful history. And um, as an example, my cousin Mary gave me this necklace that I just found here that I'm holding. And I really liked her when we were teenagers, but she really hurt me about 18 years ago. And so I don't like to wear this anymore. So then I will ask them, so would it be better to give that up? Or would it be better to keep it and feel bad every time you see it? And a lot of times they're willing to let it go at that point. The same thing is true with letters from people that they've divorced or artwork of somebody they never thought did good art, but it was a gift and so I should keep it. <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> you know, some people have a big thing about if it was a gift, I should keep it. Um, that's really hard. I can't talk them out of it. They've got to find their own reason why they can let go of it now. So step 11, I'm hoping by this time there have some been some positive changes in the person. They've experienced some successes with me. They want to keep going. They're starting to enjoy the open space that we've created. And they're beginning to trust me as a guide and a helper. And many of them call me friend. They may ask about having one of their friends come and help. Um, and I always say yes. Um, I suggest there's two ways that we can do this. Either they can have their friend come in when I'm not here and you can direct your friend what you want them to do. Do you want them to sit quietly in the corner? Do you want them to just bag up your your things to donate, you tell them how you want this to work. Or we can have the friend come when I'm there and they just sort of shadow what me and the client are doing. They watch how I talk with them, how I listen to them, what our process is. And then after that, they can come in between my visits. Um, some people have been able to do this with someone else, and I, I think that's a real plus because it tells me the client has learned how to do this. <clears throat> They've learned some real skills. Um, and by now, they're hopefully experiencing less anxiety and they feel better about themselves and they start to focus on other things in their lives. One of the things I've done with some clients, if I'm going on a vacation for two weeks, I will leave them a list. And I, I try to give clients homework if they're interested in that, just some little tasks to do before I come back next week. But for vacation time, I might give them a longer list. And I'll always put some fun things on there, like do a crossword puzzle or read three chapters in a book. And they'll say, why is this on here? And I'll say, because you've got all these books, you should be reading them and enjoying them. And so they think that's pretty, pretty interesting. And then they'll do it. So it's great. <clears throat> All right, so now after we've done a couple of rooms, um, what we're going to do is just keep repeating the same process for uh, the next rooms. And what I'm hoping to see by this time is that they have adopted some new habits and routines in their home. When they come in the door with a new bag, they're not dropping it at the door and leaving it there for a week. They're unwrapping it. They're deciding where it belongs or they're washing it, whatever needs to be done with it. They start planning more changes in their own house. They also understand this is a long process, and they might say something like, what a hole I have dug for myself. It's not a terrible thing. It's, it's sort of a realization that if I don't spend some time in my house, it's going to happen again. And then um, they are usually committed to continuing, and we'll keep meeting. So what determines success or failure for someone? A few realize they're not ready to declutter, and I, I sort of touched on that already. Um, some people 
are not ready to do the organizing, the decluttering. They're ready to really button down with their therapists and do that work instead first. Um, some start slow. They might say, well, I just want to meet once a month. And then somewhere along the line, I will have a gentle conversation with them and I'll say, you know, we could make a lot more progress and get this done sooner if you and I met, say, every other week or once a week. And at the time I bring it up, I'm hoping that they understand that the progress we've made is good, but it, it's a whole house. We're talking a whole house, and so it's going to take a while. <clears throat> they all need that continued support and review by the landlord, the fire department, the police department, um, the inspector. And so if, if that person can just touch base with that client every three months, say, you know, I'm, I'm going to come back in March, they remember that. Um, they're expecting that phone call for that appointment, and that helps them stay motivated. They have that better self-image. They're continuing to improve their skills and take care of their stuff. I had one lady, her carpet had not been vacuumed for a long, long time. We vacuumed, and then I had a cleaning company come in and clean it, and they did such a nice job. It was just the area that was available to be clean, but afterwards, she had somebody come into the house and she said they didn't even take their shoes off and they walked on my clean carpet. And so <laughs> I love that. She now sees her home in a different way. Um, and then continue, I, I hope that they continue working with their therapist. So this is the life cycle. Um, I start off about in step four or five and then we work steps six through uh, 11 and just repeat that process trying to finish one area or one room at a time. And if you work in any of the professions that we've talked about tonight, I, I hope you now understand a bit about what I do, how it relates to your role, and that we really do need you involved. Um, if you are family and friends of someone who you think is hoarding, I ask that you help them by listening more, not criticizing, and have more contact with them. Um, more than anything, they need a friend, someone they can talk to. And if you feel like you want to volunteer, you've got to take their direction. This is not your project. This is their home. And for any organizers out there, um, I, I know there aren't a lot of organizers that like to work in a hoarded home, but I'm telling you that it's very rewarding work. And with some training, you can do this too. And believe me, you are really going to be appreciated. So that's the end of my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Question. Um, when it comes to clothing, and it's because in their past, they fluctuated sizes a lot. It's very hard to part with clothing, even though um, they have sizes two, three sizes above where they currently are, and two, three sizes below where they currently are. Any um, tips for um, walking them through with the, do you need this? Do you need to keep this? Do you have other things like it? So um, I will often have them divide up their clothes by size. And we know that sizes aren't always true. Um, so that may take a little shuffling. But if they have a bin of size two and a bin of size four and a bin of size six, these are very slim people. Um, then I will say, well, you're wearing a size six now. You'd like to get back to the size two. Let's do this. Let's put a lid on the size two. We'll put a note on it that says, Julie is going to go on a diet and she's going to give herself six months and then she's going to check on these clothes and see if any of them fit. If they don't, then it might be time to donate. And I'll let them think about that suggestion. They might say, well, I need nine months. Well, that's fine. Let's do nine months. Put a date on it. Um, that gives them sort of an endpoint to work towards. 
And I will also remind them, you know, once you've had kids, it's harder to lose weight. I've just accepted the fact that I am where I am and I'm probably never going to be a size 10 again. Um, so I'm, I'm not too hard on them. I want to give them an idea that they can work with. And I will also ask them if you're keeping all of your size 12s, because that's what you're, work, you're fitting into right now, do they fit in your closet? If they say no, then I say, well, how about if we try and, and pare down another six? And then you keep the rest, and that should fit in your closet pretty well. So we could try that too. Um, if that doesn't work, I would move on to something else in the house and come back to the clothes because the clothes are too hard for them at this point. Hi, this is Maureen. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm an organizer, and when it comes to the cost of organizing, um, I will interpret for them um, uh, if they're shopping uh, and get boxes that are never opened, um, if they overspend, if a variety of things. I will suggest that there are ways they could save money that so they could afford help. And uh, one of the things I might say is, uh, do you have enough groceries that you could go without grocery shopping for a week? Uh, as I nudge further, I might say, could you give up uh, extraneous shopping for two weeks, and and if I give little tiny steps, uh, they see the benefit. Not every every person who hoards can uh, do that, but uh, many have. I've worked with many people who hoard. Yeah, those are good ideas. I like your. Um points about the using the verbal thinking. I think that's a really, I've never heard that before. I think that's a really excellent point and has a lot of application. I have two adult children with ADHD and I think there's a lot of application for that outside of just this hoarding behavior. And I like also what you had said at the end about the, really the accountability piece in the last step and that it is a marathon, it's not a sprint and you're going to continue to need the coaching at, throughout this whole process. It's just not, once you start, you're just going to keep doing it, and you're going to want to keep doing it, I think is the yes. refreshing thing about your perspective. So thank you. Yeah. Um, as far as the uh, the first point you made was about what? Your, oh, that verbal thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I, I had done it before with people who I would just, prompt with tell me what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but then when I started working with people by phone or by laptop where I'm in one place and they're in their home, I realized that I need to know what they're thinking so that I can help them make the decision. And, you know, tell me what you're picking up. You know, how big is it? Um, how long have you had? <clears throat> And and they'll say and they'll answer those questions and then they'll go on. Well, I have six water bottles. I probably don't need this one. Okay, that's great. So because of that process, I realized it does really apply to more people, even if I'm working with them. Well, even people person. with slower processing speeds, mm -hmm. right? Because that I mean, we often you can't see that, right? And you know, most people wouldn't know if you have a slower processing speed, mm -hmm. exactly, or an extremely fast one. I mean, they're yep. on to six different things while you're asking one question. They're in the bathroom while you're in the kitchen, basically in their mind. So, Ooh. yeah. Very helpful. Thank you. Hi, Diane. My name is Judy. Um, I'm wondering what you think about the difference between collecting and hoarding, or are they on the same sort of spectrum? Well, there's a formal definition of hoarding disorder, and I'm not going to repeat that, but what I will say is that if you have a collection of mugs 
and you display them and you enjoy looking at them and you occasionally add something to your collection, that's not hoarding. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, 200 mugs and all of your family members give you mugs from their trips and you've run out of room to put them and they're just all sitting in the basement in a box or boxes, um, that's clutter. If you are collecting mugs and clothing and books and hobby supplies and car parts and kitchen supplies and you have no room to put them and they're on the floor and they're preventing you from making a meal and sleeping in your bed, that's probably hoarding. So people with big houses can have a lot of stuff and not officially be have hoarding disorder until they start running out of room. They also, it also turns out that people who collect a lot of stuff, they either may lose sight of why they started collecting it or they feel the need to collect it because they just want to own it. And I don't think that's a part of the official hoarding disorder um, definition. But in my mind, if they're just keeping it to own it, um, I, I think that's a problem. I think that is hoarding. Mm. Thank you. That's helpful. Hi, I have a I have a question. Um, what do you say to people who have decided that you know this item or that item is worthwhile? you know, donating or, in, but they can't get past the idea, I paid money for it. And so they want to keep it because, because of that. Okay, so <clears throat> they have already paid money for it in the past. And what I tell people is, now you know that was a mistake. We can't really fix that problem. Um, if you donate it, someone else may find it and love it and take it home and use it. And that would be a much better situation than it's sitting on your shelf and you're not using it. Um, people need, need time to think about that concept. Um, but sometimes that helps them let go. Um, I also might say, we need to think of this as giving you a clean slate of starting over. I want to help you get caught up and have your home in a condition so that you can really function in this home. And so if you need to keep this item, maybe you can let go of something else and then we'll move on. I don't want to dwell too long on anything. Um, because then that can turn into an argument, and I certainly don't want that. Thank you. Wonderful. Any more questions from our online viewers? Visitors, I should say, since we're not able to view. <laughs> Good to see Diane. <laughs> I'm not even lying Wonderful. anymore. <laughs> well, we've got the information up um, right now, the slide, if you want to be able to get a hold of Diane. And um, once we edit her video, that'll be on our YouTube channel once she approves it. Thank you, Diane. It was really a good presentation. Um, this, we're going to stop recording, okay? And then see if anyone wants to ask any questions off the recording. Thank you, Michelle.